We're going we're gonna to begin today uh, a message that I want to apologize first if you've been in church for any length of time because I really feel this morning that I need to talk to you like you're not born again. Can somebody give me an amen? amen. <laughs> Sometimes we get so stinking religious that we don't even know what we're talking about. We, 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 we mimic phrases and words that uh, we hear from the pulpit or maybe our, our favorite preacher on TV or TV, who watches TV anymore, that we're streaming and, and they become part of our language, but we lack the understanding. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I know that was one of the things that God put in my heart when I, when I rededicated my life and I yielded my life to the calling that he had on me. I, I wanted to know why I believed what I believed, and I wanted to be able to say it in a way normal people could understand. Because sometimes, now don't, take, don't take this wrong, sometimes we're so Christian, we're no earthly good. Now, that doesn't mean your, your relationship with God or holiness. I mean that we come across like, oh, okay, I, I, boy, am I going to be in trouble with Pastor Nietzsche today, but praise the Lord. You know, I, <laughs> she says, don't say it. I used to watch those movies about Jesus and, I, and Moses, but mostly Jesus. I don't know about you. He didn't seem human to me. He seemed a little light in his loafers, if you know what I mean. He seemed like um, he was so careful about in the movies. But has anybody seen The Chosen? Anybody watch the series The Chosen? No, that's the Jesus that I see in the scripture. He's a normal guy. And he connects with people. And he cares for people. He, he, he stands for righteousness. But he preaches grace and truth. Can I get an amen? amen? And so that's what I'm talking about. I just want to talk normal this morning, okay? So just make a good confession with me, and I want you to say this whether you believe it or not. Say, I will not get offended this morning. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Say, I will receive the truth that God wants me to receive. Now, guys, I didn't say the truth that I want you to receive. You need to receive the truth that God wants you to receive. Because whether it's the written word or whether it's the spoken word, God, when you, when you put a, a desire upon God, when you put a, a draw upon God, he's going to cause that message to become alive for you. He's going to breathe on that message. What I mean is he's going he's to make it personal for you. And you'll have understanding about something that you've wondered about all your life if you draw upon God that way. Where the next person, the person next to you might not even grasp that, but they grasp something else. That's the difference between uh, uh, just having head knowledge and revelation, okay? So we're going to pray for revelation this morning. Would you bow your head? Father, I ask you this morning for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to just breathe on us and breathe on this message so that as we speak these words, God... New understanding comes, new hope comes, new vision comes, new areas of faith come alive in us. And we receive that by faith. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. John chapter 3, verse 3 is where we're going to start. Um, you know, I have, I've ministered in over 30 different nations in the world. And I've, I've ministered to millions of people. Um, and, and honestly, I like preaching to a big crowd. It's a lot easier than, than ministering to, you know, eight to ten people in a small group for me. It's just, you know, where I have a gifting. But I've noticed something in every single country I've been in, and in every one of those countries, I have preached in prisons as well. Prisons and jails. In Honduras, I think I've preached in 27 different prisons. Uh, it's, it's just something that I've always felt called to do. And I think we, as we grow as a body of Christ, we need to do that here. We need to be in every single institution, prison or jail, in the state of Iowa as we grow this ministry. Because there are people in there that are broken and want what you have. Yes. And here's what I found in all of those places. I've never had to convince anybody of God's existence. The reason I said, they may deny him, okay. 
They, they may deny what they've been taught about him. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but they, they, they really, in their heart, there is something they can't deny. And the Bible says that God put eternity in the heart of every man and woman. In other words, he put a God-sized hole in your human spirit that can only be plugged or made whole or repaired or made new by God's spirit. And every person who is a spirit, which is every person who's ever been created, is lacking that at one time or still is in their life. In other words, it's like there is a puzzle piece hole inside of a container within you called your human spirit, which is who you are, that only the puzzle piece of the Holy Spirit given by Jesus Christ can match and plug and make complete. And once that's done, your spirit is literally made new. I've never had to convince anybody of the fact that there is a God. And you want to know something else? I've really never had to convince anybody about sin. Jesus made it very clear in John chapter 15. He was going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would be everywhere. And the Holy Spirit would convict men of their sin. Now, that's still happening today. And, and th that is why there is a section of the world that is trying to make the things that Christ said illegal. They're trying to legislate God out of, out of government. They're trying to legislate God out of schools. They're trying to legislate God out of the state house. Why? Because the Holy Spirit makes them feel convicted. It makes them feel bad. Well, thank God they feel bad. And thank God when you sin, you feel bad. Because if you didn't feel bad when you sinned, I'm worried about you. Actually, I don't even know if you're born again. Because the Holy Spirit in you will convict you of your... When you, we fall, when you fall short of what God has for you, when you live at a lower standard than what God has for you, something on the inside says there's something better. There's something better. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think the devil has a plan, especially in the United States. I've seen it in India, I've seen it in Nigeria, I've seen it in Burkina Faso, I've seen it in Mali, and I think Satan has the same plan here. If he could, if he could shut down the churches, is what he convinces people of, then they're not going to feel bad about their sin anymore. The truth is the church is never meant to make you feel bad about your sin our job is to show you how you can live above your sin. How you can be free from the control of something that it keeps taking you back. You, we take three steps forward and, and then the, the sin that has control of us tries to take us five backwards. So we take two steps forward and, and the sin that still has control of us takes us backwards. And if it's that way for you in Christ, could you imagine how bad it is for those outside of Christ? I don't think a doctor would ever tell somebody more about the hole that they have in their arm thinking it's going to help them feel better because actually the more they talk about the injury or the wound that they have in their arm, the more they're going to think about the pain. Am I correct? Well, what, a, what a good doctor would do, Jesus was sent for the sick, is say, there is a remedy, there is a cure, and I'm going to start the procedure, but you've got to help me by believing in it. <laughs> I get an Amen. John 3, 3, this Pharisee came up to Jesus, and, and he was really seeking God, okay? He wasn't, he wasn't trying to disprove Jesus. He wasn't trying to get in an argument. And he said, you know, I, 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 want to, I want to know God. I want to experience God. I've been living this Jewish faith, and it's not making it work. It's not working for me. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again. Everybody say born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God. When he said you cannot see, he meant you cannot, and literally, you cannot experience. You cannot, you cannot comprehend. 
you, you can't even uh, get, get a picture of it so that you can begin to accept it because it's foreign to you. You can't see, you can't perceive, you can't experience everything that God wants to do in your life and my life. The kingdom of God is, is, is not necessarily a government. The kingdom of God is God's ways that he has planned for us to live the best version of us that we could possibly be. The kingdom of God is God's way. God's way for you, God's way for me. His, 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 his means of doing things, his ways of doing things, his motives of doing things. It's really the mind of God for us being the best version of us that we can be. And Jesus said, you can't even comprehend it. You've been trying all these years, Mr. Pharisee, and you haven't made it because you can't, you can't get it in the shape that you're in. I was watching some videos this, I don't know, for some reason them YouTube shorts can get me. And I've been watching these videos, and there's these little kids that either they hear for the first time or they see for the first time. And when they hear their mom or dad's voice for the first time or they see for the first time, the expression on these babies' faces is just like, like, it scares them at first, and then they start to smile, and they become so happy, it's hard. They can't contain it. They don't know they're supposed to contain it. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to have have the lenses of our heart clear so we can see God, our Father, for the first time. He He wants us to have the ears of the Holy Spirit so we can hear His voice for the first time. And it'll bring inexpressible joy to us to know that we have a purpose in Him. And He knows us and wants to know us personally. So Nicodemus says this. He said, remember, he can't see spiritual things. He's not a spiritual guy. Okay, he's not been born again. He has a broken spirit, just like many people in the world, and just like many people in the church. They have a broken spirit. And so they can't see, they can't perceive, they can't experience the voice of God, the sight of God. Are you getting it? And and so here he goes right back to what he knows. He says, How can, I'm an old guy, I'm 65 years old. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb to be born again? He can't see. So he goes to what he does know. He says, well, last time I was born, I came out of my mother's womb. So if I'm going to be born again, it must happen the same way. And Jesus said, that's not exactly the way it works. He said, I assure you, no one can enter because you're not there. No one can enter the kingdom of God, God's ways of doing things, seeing God's ways, hearing God's ways. No one can do that without being born of water and spirit. And don't get religious. Religious people say that means you get baptized and then you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, sure, you could take it there, but that's not what Jesus meant. What happens when a mama's about ready to give birth? She breaks what? She breaks her water. That's what Jesus is talking about. He says, you have to experience a natural birth, and you have to experience a spiritual birth. He says, no one can, can, can do it unless they've been born of water and spirit. Because humans, the water part, can only produce human life. But the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives birth to a spiritual life. That deep calling to deep. I want to see out of my spirit. I want to see out of my natural eyes, but I want to see out of my spiritual eyes. As a matter of fact, I want to see out of my spiritual eyes more than I see out of my natural mind eyes. And I want to hear out of my spiritual ears more than I hear out of my natural. The truth, I'll just tell you, the truth is the goal in this life is for my spiritual eyes and my, my spiritual ears to govern or have more input in my life than my natural ears and my natural eyes. Because God is more real than the things on this earth. Because he is eternal and this earth is not. Am I talking too fast and too hard? Am I talking simple enough? Praise the Lord. I want want to be born of the Spirit and I want to see out of my spiritual eyes. He says you can't do that unless you have birth of the Holy Spirit. So don't be surprised or don't be shocked when I say you got to be born again. It's not another natural birth. It's a spiritual birth. He said, the wind, speaking of how the Spirit works, it 
blows wherever it wants. Just as you, you can hear the wind, you can, you can tell where, you can't tell where it's coming from, you can't really tell where it's going. You can see the effects of the wind, but you can't see the wind. I could see dust come up, and now, now I'm seeing natural things that I've naturalized. But I don't, have, I don't have wind eyes, I don't have spiritual eyes. I can't see that unless there's natural things happening. Then I can see the effects of the wind, but I still can't see the wind. I can feel the effects of the wind, but I, but, but, but I, I can't see it. So I can't understand it with my natural mind. So I don't know where it's coming from, and I don't know where it's going, because I can't see it. With, I, have to do, I have to understand the wind by faith. How are these things possible, Nicodemus asked. And to King James, he says, how can these things be? And I think that's really, if we were to talk that way now, we, we would say, how can these things be? How are these things possible? That I can see through eyes I've never seen before. That I can hear through ears I've never heard before. That I can literally hear the voice of God, not in a natural way, but in a spiritual way. That I can literally see what God's doing in my life, not in a natural way, but a spiritual way. How is this possible? How, how, you know what I'm saying? Just like Nicodemus says, I, if I'm going to be born again, i got to go about it this way. This is how it has to happen. i got to go back into my mother's womb. How does it work? You want to... Why so many Christians live far below the level of life that God wants them to is because they're trying to live a, natu- a spiritual life through natural senses. They have the ability to see out of the Spirit. They have the ability to hear the voice of God. But they run everything through the filter of their mind, and their mind was never made to understand spiritual things. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm going to make it plain for you, the Bible says this very plainly, the man without the Holy Spirit cannot, 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 will not, and will never understand the things of the Spirit. Because you have to have the Holy Spirit so that you can begin to comprehend or grab a hold of or perceive or see and hear spiritual things. So he's given us spiritual ears. And here's, he goes on, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what no eye has seen, natural eye, what no natural ear has heard. I see now these are the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And he reveals them to us by his spirit. And we call that the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ, don't you? If the Bible says you've got it, you've got it. I have the mind of Christ because I've been born again. So why do I keep trying to think out of this mind about all things? I need to filter this through this and the word. I need to filter what I'm thinking. Come on, I need to govern what I'm thinking by the Word of God, which is the Scripture, is the Bible, and I need to filter, I need to think through uh, the the perception of the Holy Spirit that is within me. Remember, God speaks to us three ways, and a major part of the way God speaks. He speaks to us through the Word of God, the Bible. He speaks to us through the Holy Spirit within us, and He speaks to us through the church. What's happening this morning is he's speaking to you about how to hear the voice of God, how to be born again. How are these things possible? How do they work? Well, Jeremiah 29, 11, we've got to go there first because the first thing we've got to do is we've got to level the playing field here. Because those who don't know God and many who do know God think that God wants stuff for them that's not very good. I've got to quit this, I've got to quit that, I'll never be happy again. And to be honest with you, you don't have to quit anything to come to the Lord Jesus Christ except for yourself. I really think Jesus came to save us not just from our sin, but from ourselves. He wants better things for us than what we want. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Here's the plans. They're good. They're not bad. <clears throat> not for disaster, but to give you hope and the future. God has a hope for you that you can't possibly comprehend. They are far better than anything that you could hope or imagine. 
And the Bible says he's revealed them to us by his spirit. He, he has good plans for you. There, there's an incredible evangelist. His name is Oral Roberts. I, 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 I have degrees from his university. And I'll tell you what, he was persecuted because of this one statement. He would start his events and he would say, God is good. And the church persecuted him for that. Well, God's ways are, God's ways are deep. God's ways are mysterious. God's ways are unknown. He knows things that we don't know. Come on, read on. But he has revealed them to us by his spirit. The things he has prepared and destined and planned for us. The hope he has for you. The plan he has for you. He's going to reveal it to you by your spirit. We are spiritual beings living in a natural world. We are a spiritual being. We have a body that we use just like an earth suit. And we have a mind. Uh, Our spirit should rule over our body and our spirit should rule over our mind. When we get it back in the order that God designed it to be, we can hear from the spirit and we can see from the spirit very clearly. John 10.10, Jesus put it this way. The thief, the devil's purpose is to steal, is to kill, and is to destroy. That's the devil. So stop listening to a fallen way of thinking that says the devil wants to take, God wants to take from you. Stop listening to the thoughts that God wants to destroy you. God wants to destroy what you built. That's not true. God, God, he, he says, my purpose, Jesus' purpose, is to give them a rich and a satisfying life. Psalms 103. Let's praise the Lord. Number three, here's what God does. He forgives all, everybody say all. Of my sin. He'll forgive it all. That doesn't give you a license just to go out and sin, but He'll forgive you of what you've done. Are you hearing me? Being forgiven of what you have done doesn't give you permission to keep doing it. Because, because I'll just be honest with you, I wish, somebody, I wish somebody would have told me this when I was 16. Because when I was 16, I was willing to, I was willing to do whatever I wanted to do as, will, as long as I was willing to pay the price. People go to hell because they want to pay their own price for their sin. And Jesus already paid the price for our sin. He forgives you of all your sin. He heals you of all your diseases. Come on. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and mercy. He fills my life with good things so my youth is renewed like the eagles. How does he do these things? Through the filling. So my youth is renewed. The Bible says very plainly in Romans chapter 8, if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, if he doesn't live in you, you're not a born-again Christian. If he doesn't live in you, you're going to hell. I'm sorry. Because it comes through salvation. He comes through salvation. And if the Spirit of Christ lives in you, he will give the God kind of strength to your mortal body, your flesh. That's how healing comes. How how are these things possible? Well, that's how. So if I'm dealing with sickness and disease, the first thing that I do is check myself for sin so I don't have a hole in the bag. And then what I do is I start filling myself with the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God is what produces strength in my body. Vitamins can help. Prescriptions can help. Come on, diet and exercise can help. You don't want to fight God, right? But the thing that restores my body is His Spirit. The thing that gives me strength is His Spirit. See, in Romans chapter 3, it's written, how, are the, how do these things work? For every, come on, everybody sinned. Everybody has sinned. Don't, don't tell me you haven't, because you know you have. The Holy Spirit's done his job. Everybody has sinned, so we're all in the same boat. That's the purpose of Romans chapter 3. You're not better because you've been going to church for 26 years than that person out there who's never been to church. Because we've all sinned. That makes us all equal. We all are short of, it says, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. He's got a standard for you that's good. 
He's got a standard for you that has hope and a future. He's got a standard for you that, where he wants to bring life, a rich and satisfying life, so you can live the best version of you that he ever determined to do. Romans chapter uh, 3, verse 24, yet in his grace... God freely makes us right in his sight. That's important. He did this through Christ Jesus. Why? When? How did he do it? When he freed us from the penalty of our sin. There's a couple of theologians in the house, and they tell you, what's the penalty of sin, anybody? Death. The penalty of sin is death. Now, maybe you should stop thinking about the cross. Maybe you should stop thinking about the gallows. Maybe you should stop thinking about lethal injection. Or maybe you should stop thinking that that it means that God is going to make you sick. No, God is a good God. He doesn't do that. And he's going to take you home because of your sin. No, that's that's not the way it works. The penalty of sin is death, and Jesus freed us from that penalty. So I'm going to do this quickly, but I'm going to try and help you. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for whose sin? Our sin. People are, did you know that your heathen brother-in-law who will not acknowledge Jesus has had his sins forgiven, but he hasn't accepted it yet? And therefore, it's not valid. It can be. Because he says, he says, for He's freed us from the penalty of sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. When I begin to receive the fact that Jesus died for me, the evidence of that is he shed his blood. When When I begin to understand that his blood being shed proved his death, which means that the penalty of death, penalty of the law, which is death, was satisfied for me. Now the accounts between me and God are even, if I believe that and I receive that. But that doesn't make me saved yet. But I have to understand that. The penalty of of the whole law is what? The, the, the whole law was put in place for a simple reason, to, to account for everybody's sin. Every sin that ever could be, could be committed was in the law, and it was, it was numerified. There was a number given to it. There was an assignment given to the value of that, and it was death. And so the whole law sums up all of our sin. Why? So one price could be paid. So one penalty can be paid. So Jesus could satisfy the righteous requirements of the law for us. Now we've all sinned except for him. We've all sinned. So how is he going to satisfy the righteous? What's required of the law for us? What's required of the law for us? If you answer answer me that I live perfectly, dude, you're going to hell because you don't get it. Well, you might go out of ignorance, but the law is a school teacher, the Bible says, to lead us to Jesus. The law tells us we can't do it on our own. We're always going to make mistakes. We're to try to, to, to live up to the standard of the law, but we know we're never going to. And so Jesus paid, he finalized the bill through the law. And the final bill was the death of somebody who was perfect. The death of the Father. The death of God through His Son, Jesus. Okay. Let me, let me go on. Let me go on. Let me go on. But when He, it says in Isaiah 53, yet it was our weakness that Jesus carried. It was our sorrow that weighed Him down. Jesus was pierced for our rebellion, not not his. He was crushed for our sin, not not his. The Son of God was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, every single one of us, like sheep, we've gone our own way at one time or another, and we've left God's path to follow our own. (coughs) Yet it was the Lord's will. 
it was the Lord's will to lay on him, to lay on Jesus, the sin of us all. He, Jesus, who knew no sin, was made to be sin so that, why? So that we could become what he was, the righteousness of God. He became what we are when God laid on him our sin, and he sacrificed himself on the cross so we could become what he was, a son of God. It goes on, it says, 1 Peter 2, 24, Jesus personally carried our sins in his body, not in his head, not, not in his spirit, in his body on the cross, so that we can be dead to sin. So sin no longer would control us. Now it's a choice. Did you know that? Once you've been born again, sin can't control you. It's your choice. Now you may not be strong in the head yet, and you may need some help renewing your mind, but once you get it, it's a choice. Before your spirit was born again, you couldn't stop sinning. Now you're born again, and you have God's spirit within you, and his spirit will compel you to do what's right. And it's a choice. And if you're honest with yourself, you know it. Some of you are just making it way before you get to that point of sin. Are you understanding? By his wounds, you are healed. He died on the cross so he could separate sin, your sin. Whose sin did he bear? Yours? Whose sin did he bear? Mine? Where did he bear it? In his body. On the cross. And he experienced death. And when Jesus died, just like when you die, your spirit and your soul are separated from your body. The part of you of who you are, the eternal part of you, will be separated from your body. So, so far, except for one person, uh, nobody's gotten out of this death thing. Your spirit and your soul will separate from your body. Jesus' spirit and soul separated from his body. But where was your sin? In his body. Jesus suffered the agony of death, so he was separated. It says he, he, he went to hell and he threw off uh, the powers of hell. Jesus was in that place in the center of the earth, but your sin was in his body on the cross for three days because three days through Jewish law, it's dead. It's not coming back. Then he came back. And he picked up his body again after the sin was declared dead, powerless, no longer useful in controlling you. Are you hearing it? He experienced death on the cross and his blood proved that death. The shedding of blood and your sin was in his body. And after three days, it's like he got up. The Spirit justified him, it says, and he shook out the dust of sin in his body, and he put it back on for you and for me. And he he went from that place to the highest place of heaven with his own blood. Why is that important? So you can understand your sin has been separated from you. What is controlling you, if you're born again, is no longer your sin. It is your head. And your head needs to be changed. God will make your spirit new. Sometimes he'll heal your body instantly. But it's your job to renew your mind. How do I do that? I'm in the word of God. I'm in church on Sunday. I'm in prayer, listening to the Holy Spirit. I'm in communion with him. Romans chapter 8 verse 3 says, the law of Moses was unable to save you guys, and me too. Because of my weakness, because of my flesh, my sinful nature. So see, here's what God did. He did what the law could not do. The law couldn't make me right, because I was never going to be able to do it. It's still a standard for me, okay? But I know I'm never going to win that 400-yard 400, 400 hurdle. I'm never going to win it, because I'm going to miss a hurdle every single time. But I don't have to win it to be a champion in God. I just have to keep running. 
because he cleared the hurdles for me. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we have. And in that body, in Jesus' body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for us. And he did it by separating your sin and its nature from you. All right, there's a theologian. I can hear it. I can hear it. There's a theologian in the house saying, well, that doesn't match up. I thought we always had a sinful nature. What, what does it mean to have a circumcision of the heart? The fleshy part is cut off. Does it regrow? No. It's removed from you. The remnants are here. That's why they say the battlefield is in the mind. And I have to renew the mind. Because I want to live out of here. I want to live out of God's best. I want to be the best version of me that God, God wants me to be. But I've got to see things through my spiritual eyes. And I've got to hear things through my spiritual ears. And I've got to feed my spirit so I'm just as healthy on the inside as I am on the out or better. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us. Is, is the word of God true? If it's true, then the sin's control in your life is over. Now it's a choice. And I choose to serve God. Me and my household will serve God. Me and my household will bow our knee and bow our heart and bow, bow our mind and bow our words to what God's will is in our life. I'm going to choose that. I may, not make a, I may not make the perfect decision every minute of every day. I know I don't. But that is my choice. And every morning I'm getting up and I'm going to choose that again. And I'm going to do my first 15. I'm going to get in the Word of God. And I'm going to feed my spirit. I'm going to begin to worship Him and, and, and feed my spirit. I'm going to pray and I'm going to begin to understand His spirit and His will for my life. Every single morning. And if I miss it, I'm not going to beat myself up. If I, if I get busy and I forget to eat lunch, I'm not going to beat myself up for missing lunch. I'm going to make sure I get a good dinner. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> he did this. Jesus did this. He died on the cross for you and for me carried our sin, separated it from you and me so that the just require, the thing that you think you have to do is run that 400 meter hurdle and, and clear every hurdle so that that requirement of the law would be fully satisfied in us. Why? Because when we miss it, there's a penalty and he's already paid the penalty. And his blood is in the heavens as evidence that it has been paid for you and for me. It speaks a testimony about you that you're righteous. You're not, you're not a sinner that's never going to heaven. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are a miracle waiting to happen. You are the future waiting to unfold. You are a tool in the hand of God that he wants to make a masterpiece out of something on this earth. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied in you and me. But there's a for us who no longer follow a separated and dead sinful nature. If, 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 if I were to talk to God about how to write this so that people didn't get confused, this is the conversation we have. Why don't you talk about separating the sinful nature from us, and when you get to this part, because it doesn't exist on us anymore, talk to us about our weakness of our flesh. I'm no longer going to follow the way I feel, and what I want. Come on. I'm not going to feel, I'm not going to follow my hunger. I'm not going to follow my, my, my need for pleasure. I'm not going to follow. 
my need to sleep too much. I'm not going to follow my desire to drink too much. Are you hearing me? I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit. And that law is fully satisfied. It's fully satisfied, satisfied in us for those who follow the Spirit. Why have you been living below God's standard? Because you're either following your body, you're following an old way of thinking, you're following natural circumstances and situations instead of following the Spirit of God. How can you live the life that God wants you to live in the Spirit if you don't know the Holy Spirit? We've been trying to live this life, some of us, so long that we've almost given up because we've been trying to live it by what we know. We're trying to get back into our mother's womb because it's the only way we know. Well, it's impossible anyway. You can't do it. We no longer think as the world thinks. We think through our spirit. John 17, 3, Jesus said it this way. I know I'm running over and this is the way to have eternal life. You want it? Yes. Then know, experience, experience, know the only true God and know him through Jesus Christ. There's no other way you're going to get the Holy Spirit except through the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one can understand, no one can comprehend, no one can connect to, no one can perceive the Father except through Him. Jesus told His disciples, if you really know me, then you know my Father. If you experience me, you experience my Father. So how's that done? If you openly declare, Romans chapter 10, you got to say it. You got to openly declare that Jesus is your Lord. But you also got to believe in your heart that God raised him for the dead. It's not, it's not one or the other, it's got to be both. You've got to believe not with your head, your heart. And you've got to confess him as your Lord. You know what that means? My life is no longer mine. I'm surrendering. I'm giving my heart to Jesus. What does that mean? I'm giving my past to him. Oh, we're good. We want to give him our past, right? Nobody wants to keep their past. I, I want to give him my past. But we also need to give him who we are today and who we're going to be tomorrow and everything we might be tomorrow. Well, make it plain for me, Pastor Kenny. What does that mean? Okay, you run a check with the Holy Spirit everything, on everything you think, say, and do. That's what Jesus being the Lord of your life is. Now, he knows you're not going to make every hurdle. He knows you're going to say something wrong or say something that's not in the version that he has. He knows you, you're going to miss it, okay? It's not about perfection. It's about being led by the Spirit. The righteous requirements of what, what the whole Bible is all about is fully satisfied in you if you're led by the Spirit. Everything I think, say, and do, I'm going to try to be led by the Spirit. And when I realize I'm not, I'm going to repent as quickly as I find out and as publicly as I do it. That's just my rule. You see, it's believing in your heart that you're made right with God. But when you openly declare your faith, that's when you're saved. And here at High Point... We do that every Sunday. We ask you, we ask everybody, if you need to make a commitment to the Lord, then you do that between you and God right now. And we pray a prayer. But then, like next Sunday, we are going to openly declare Jesus is our Lord, and we're going to have baptismal service. We're going to die with him in baptism and be raised to a new life. Come on. 
That's how we do it here at High Point. Openly declaring our faith through the act of baptism. Acts 2.38, this is the very first sermon that was preached after the resurrection of Jesus. Peter stood up and he said, each of you, every single person, must repent of your sins. Repentance does not mean I'm sorry. Repentance is turning from what you're doing and doing it a different way. Turning from your way and doing it God's way. I'm sorry is the beginning of repentance. Godly sorrow produces repentance. The forgiveness of sin comes through repentance, not I'm sorry. That's why some of you are divorced. Because he kept saying, I'm sorry, but never changed. And she kept saying, I'm sorry, but kept doing the same thing. Come on, I'm just talking like real people today. I'm sorry is not the way to forgiveness. It is a step toward forgiveness. I'm not going to do that again. You got to help me because I'm afraid I'm going to. That's repentance. And then you manage your decision of the rest of your life. I'm going to try not to do that. I'm going to try not to do that. And it's so much easier when you renew your mind. But when you repent of your sin and you turn to God, you'll be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. That's when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want everything that God has for me. And the very first thing that God wants for each and every one of you is to have the Holy Spirit. Not on a shelf like that, that seventh grade basketball trophy you have. Right here, on the throne of your heart. I have the Holy Spirit ruling and reigning me. That's why High Point Church, this is what our whole model is this. We love, we lead, we teach. We love God, we love people. We lead people to Jesus, and we teach people how to follow Him. How do you do that? Through the Word, through the church, through the Holy Spirit within you. So the righteous requirements of the law could be fully met in you, and you're living the best version of you. Not by your own strength alone, but with Him, by His power. Not by, not by power, not by strength, but by the Spirit of the Lord. You are an overcomer. How are these things possible? With my relationship with the Holy Spirit. My relationship with the Word. My relationship with the church. Would you bow your heads with me? Praise the Lord. We all know that we can be better than we are. And this is a good time to ask God to help you be a better version of you. But I'm going to ask you, if you have never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've never been born of His Spirit, then I want to pray with you this morning. Or if if you've been struggling in this thing called Christianity, and you're not living a life that's yielding to God, then that's the time today that I want to pray with you too. We're either going to ask Jesus to be the Lord of our life for the first time, or we're going to recommit that he's the Lord of our life today, and we're going to manage that decision for the rest of our life. And if that's you this morning, or you're with me online today, I want you to raise your hand up so I know who I can pray with this morning. Please raise them up high so I can see. Yes? Is there anybody else? Yes? Is there anybody else? Don't be shy. Come on. Don't be shy. Praise the Lord. Somebody's in here this morning and you haven't raised your hand, but your heart is beating about as fast as it can. You're more aware of your heart beating than anything else right now. That's God tapping on your heart saying, here I am. I stand at the door of your heart and I'm knocking. Open the door and I'll come in. Open the door and I'll come in. Who is that? Raise your hand up, would you please? (coughs) Yes, I see that. Thank you. Thank you for being brave. Put your hand on your heart, and we're going to pray this together. Dear Heavenly Father, I do believe in you. 
I believe in your son Jesus. And I believe he died for me. I believe you've raised him from the dead. Today, I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I surrender. I give myself to you. I repent of my sin. I'm turning from them. I'm turning towards you. Fill me with your spirit. Wash me of my sins. From this point on, I'm going to try my best to serve you. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Let's give those that just said that prayer, maybe for the first time or the second or third time, a hand clap of praise. Welcome, guys. Welcome, welcome to the family of God or welcome back to the family of God. Amen. Thank you for a wonderful word. Mm. Amen. Hallelujah. So like if you made that decision, then there is a card that you were given on the way in. Please fill that card out. Um, put your email, your, your mobile number in there. We're going to contact you and we have a book that we want to send you. It's absolutely free to let you know what your next step is. And if you made Jesus the Lord of your life, for the first time or you've recommitted after being gone for a while your next step might be baptism next sunday right after service at the end of service we're going to baptize those in water who made jesus the lord of their life as a public confession Amen. put that card in the offering bucket as it goes by there's little check off boxes on there so that is your next step if you prayed that prayer fill out that connect card let us know and we'll get that book to you in the mail this week amen, amen. Now, those of you that call High Point home, this is our time to give. We're a church that gets the word out there. We're a church that supports other local ministries that are doing mighty things locally, nationwide, and internationally. There's Convoy, Convoy of Hope and other ministries that we do support. So you can either give online or through the buckets as they go by. You know, God designed the church to work through its giving. Now, he said a standard is 10% is what we give uh, uh, from our increase. Uh, you establish that with God because God doesn't want you to give reluctantly. He doesn't want you to give by twisting of the arm, the Bible says. You should decide before you come what you are to give. But you know, as you receive from the local church, you give back. And that's how we're able to do what we do and how we'll be able to reach the city and transform it for Jesus Christ. Amen. Before the ushers pick that up, we're going to pray over that offering. And we're not going to spend too much time in the hospitality area because we're going to head on over to the pool for our picnic. All right, let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, I'm so thankful for your word today. I'm thankful that it changes us. And we're going to give, Lord, not only our tithe, but our tithe and over that an offering because we want your word to reach places all across this world, Father, so the light can shine in those dark places. And each person that's giving today, Father, bless them. Multiply their seed. Meet their needs, Father. And I thank you that the devourer is rebuked for the tither's sake. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.